Now I'm going to introduce you to phase lag based connectivity measures. So these are measures, connectivity measures that are based on phases and phase clustering a little bit similar to the phase synchron or phase clustering methods that I introduced you to a few videos ago, but these are based on phase lags. And so first I'm going to introduce the motivation for ignoring phase angle differences of zero radians or pi radians. And then I will introduce you to one of the specific methods for uh, phase lag based connectivity, and that is called the phase lag index. There are several methods that are all based on looking at phase lags, and essentially they're all quite similar. I'm going to focus on the phase lag index, mainly because it's the simplest, I think, of the of this family of uh, synchronization methods. Okay, so let's start. So we already discussed volume conduction and the fact that volume conduction is instantaneous in time. So that means when you measure, uh, so this the, the electrical fields generated by this population of cells here contributes instantaneously in time to the activity measured from all of these electrodes. So that means that if there's nothing else happening in the brain, only this one source, the synchronization between these two electrodes is spurious. It's not true synchronization. It's, it's just reflecting the fact that these two electrodes are measuring the same underlying source. And the synchronization between these guys is instantaneous in time. And instantaneous in time translates to a phase lag of zero or pi. Now remember, this is not about the phases themselves. This is about the difference of the phase angle time series between this electrode and this electrode. So it's sensible that if the phase angle time series is instantaneous and identical, then their difference is obviously going to be zero. So that explains why volume conduction would predict a phase lag of zero. But how about pi? How do we get pi? Well, pi comes from the fact that we have uh, electrical fields that form these dipoles, and so there's going to be a sink and a source, which means that the flow of ions is going to be positive in one direction and negative in the other direction, even when it is instantaneous. It's the same electrical field, so it would be positive here and negative here, or it would be negative here and positive here. So therefore, these two electrodes would be synchronized with a phase lag of zero, whereas this electrode and this electrode, assuming the dipole is, you know, sort of oriented like this, so the electrical fields are coming around like this. So then these two electrodes are also instantaneously synchronized, but with a phase lag of minus pi. So with that idea in mind, people have developed phase lag based synchronization measures uh, with the idea with the assumption that uh, phase lags of zero or pi should be ignored because they can be true synchronization or they can be spurious due to volume conduction so when we look at the complex plane you see that a phase angle of zero and a phase angle of pi corresponds to exactly the real axis so therefore, we say that if there is synchronization that has a preferred phase angle that's basically just lying along the real axis, positive or negative, then it can be true zero phase lag connectivity or it can be a artifact of volume conduction. So let's imagine here we have these uh, polar plots and imagine that these vectors are phase angle differences between two electrodes. So these are the differences in the phase angles between two electrodes, let's say over time. So here you can see these are clustered along the real axis. Now the thing is, in the brain, there is true zero phase lag synchronization. There's also very short low latency synchronization that is not zero, but because of a little bit of noise and sampling variability, it can be difficult to distinguish from zero. So therefore, a situation like this or like this could be volume conduction or it could be true synchronization. But we can contrast that with a situation like this where the distribution of phase angles is off the real axis. And now this cannot be artifactual due to volume conduction. This cannot be a volume conduction driven synchronization. 
Instead, this must be a true interaction between the two uh, electrodes or, you know, between the two neural populations that those electrodes are measuring. And so basically this is the idea of phase lag indices, phase lag kinds of uh, synchronization measures. We just play a little bit on the conservative side and we say we are allowing to risk the possibility of missing some true connectivity in order to prevent from having the artifact of volume conduction. Now that leads to some trade-offs between sensitivity and robustness to volume conduction. And I'm going to talk more about that trade-off in uh, I think two or three videos from now. It's going to be a question of when you should use phase lag measures versus phase clustering measures. Anyway, I hope that by now you have an idea, you have a good intuition of uh, why volume conduction would predict a phase lag of zero or pi and why it's useful to, um, why it can be useful to ignore synchronization with these uh, phase lags. Okay, now I'm going to show you the formula for the phase lag index. Now, when you first look at this thing, when I first show it on the screen, it might look really intimidating and like a really long, complicated formula, but it's actually pretty straightforward. It's pretty intuitive. I'm going to spend a minute now to walk you through this formula and you will see that it is fairly straightforward. Now, first of all, before talking about the entire formula, I would like to point out the similarity between major features of this formula and the formula for intersite phase clustering that you already know from several videos ago. So we have the phase angle differences between electrode J and electrode K. So the phase angle difference over time at each time point, and that is put into Euler's formula. And that gives us complex vectors, so vectors in the complex plane that are unit vectors, so amplitude of one, and the phase angle of these vectors is defined by the difference of the phase angles between electrode J and electrode K. Okay, so there's that part, and then we average them together. We divide by N and we sum up all of these vectors. So in fact, if you would take out these two parts here, we would still get exactly the same uh, formula that we saw a few videos ago for phase clustering, including the, the magnitude of the vector here, this absolute value indicator here. Okay, so I hope you can see that part of the formula. Now, before we average together, there's two additional transformations. The first transformation is that we're not dealing with these difference vectors themselves, or these vectors with angles defined by the uh, differences, themselves. Instead, we are projecting them onto the imaginary axis. So that's what this symbol indicates. We are taking these vectors and just considering their imaginary part, which is the projection onto the imaginary axis. So that is not this vector down here. It's actually going to be just the imaginary component of that vector, which will be this dot. So you can see that here we have all of these vectors here. And then we take the imaginary part and that's just projecting them all here. So we get, so, so this part of the formula, when we get here, that converts these vectors into a collection of dots that are all along the imaginary axis like this. And then the next step is this sigin function, which is sine. This stands for sine. Now this is not sine like a sinusoid. This is sine like S-I-G-N. So we're just looking at whether the projection of these phase angle difference based vectors and then their imaginary parts uh, is net. So whether the imaginary component of these vectors is negative or positive. So in this particular example, all of these, uh, the result of this uh, part of the formula here, this transform here is, is going to be a bunch of minus ones, right? Because every vector projects onto the imaginary axis negatively below the real axis. This is the negative side of the imaginary axis. So by this point in the formula, we have converted these phase angle differences to just a sequence of minus ones. There's like, you know, 20 of these vectors. So there's 20 minus ones here. And then we average all of those together. Now, obviously in this case, that's going to be minus one. They're all minus one. So the average is minus one. And then we take the absolute value and that turns out to be one, of course. So the PLI for this case, we don't even need to, you know, we can just look at the formula and compute the PLI exactly based on visual inspection, which is going to be one.
So you can also see from these transformations, in particular this sign transformation, that we don't actually care about the total amount of clustering. What we care about is whether these vectors on the whole are projecting to the same side of the uh, imaginary axis. So these vectors could all be distributed all around here. The PLI would still be one, as long as every vector is pointing down. Now the PLI would also be one if all the vectors are pointing up. However, if half of these vectors were pointing up, so pointing you know, above the real axis, so they would project positively onto the imaginary axis, and if half of the vectors were pointed down like this, then the PLI would be exactly zero. And that's because here we would have 10 plus ones and 10 minus ones, and their average is going to be zero. And so that is the basis for the phase lag index. So the phase lag index is really just telling us whether the collection of phase angle differences are consistently it pointing in the same direction relative to along the imaginary axis relative to the real axis. Okay, now the phase lag index is not the only game in town. This is not the only method for computing synchronization based on the principle of ignoring phase lag differences of zero or pi. There are several other methods. There's like the debiased phase lag index and the weighted debiased phase lag index and phase slope index, imaginary coherence, uh, corrected imaginary coherence, and pff, I'm sure I'm missing a couple of other ones, but it doesn't matter. So there are several different methods for um, computing this kind of connectivity. I'm focusing on the PLI because I think it's just the easiest, it's the simplest to explain, and it's the easiest to understand. And once you get this formula, once you can gain some intuition about this formula, then all these other methods are, you know, more or less closely related to this, just slight variations.